gold trails and ghost town. Share the adventures of our early pioneers as we explore the development of the Pacific Northwest and beyond with your host, Mike Roberts, and historian, Bill Barley. Welcome to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. I'm Mike Roberts, and Bill Barley's here. And today we're actually doing something which we've avoided doing for all the years we've been doing the show. But yep. today, Barkerville gets its due. Barkerville and Williams Creek, Mike, because they go hand in hand. And of course, Williams Creek was, was at one time the greatest placer gold creek in British Columbia, bar none. Barkerville was the preeminent gold town. And what we're really talking about is we're talking about placer miners, and they fall into four categories. Miners and dreamers, schemers and thieves. That's musical. That's great. And we'll concentrate, I think, in the first two, the miners and the dreamers. And when we concentrate in the first two in that early part of the, mid part of the last century, really 1860s and 1870s, a lot of names come to mind. Names like Billy Barker, well-known, the famous Caribou Cameron, but other names, lesser-known names, Vital LaForest and William Dutch Bill Dietz and Michael Burns and uh, Ned Stout and hundreds and hundreds of names of fascinating characters who flooded into this area when gold was king in British Columbia. Okay. Barkerville, the Caribou, Williams Creek, Richfield, all of those places. After we come back from this break, don't go away. Welcome back to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. We're heading to the Caribou today, to Barkerville, and... Uh, 18, what, 58? What, what, what's well, no, here? 1861, Mike, and by 1861, those creeks to the east of Barkerville had essentially been discovered, Keithley Creek and, uh, and Cunningham Creek and Antler Creek, and there's a big camp at Antler Creek, and somebody tells a miner there that he thinks there's gold to the west. And, at, at, and I think that somebody is the, is the kind of shadowy John Rose, which is a rather famous miner in the Caribou. Few people know about him. But the guy he tells is a guy called William Dietz, and they call him Dutch Bill, because he's, he's German. Most of the Germans were known as, as Dutch, which is, which is rather strange. So Dutch Bill Dietz goes into that area with several other companions, and a lot of people claim to have been with him in years after. We don't know exactly who was with him, but probably Vital LaForce was there, probably Michael Burns, probably a guy called Costello, and probably a guy called Brown. So those five probably make up the original party that goes into an unnamed creek. And they come down through this creek and they come to a canyon. And they aren't that experienced because they start panning in the canyon. And you should have panned above or below a canyon, of course, if you're a placer man. Why is that? Because the gold doesn't stick in a canyon, not much of it. The water is, goes through the canyon too quickly. They had to be green as grass. That's there, right. So they were pretty green. But they did find some gold. And the gold was not spectacular gold, Mike. It was $1.25, the maximum, the best pan they got was $1.25, and the guy who found it was Dutch Bill Dietz. So they called, the, they called this particular area, they called him Dutch Bill Dietz, and they called it Williams Creek, after William Dietz, of okay, course. Okay, okay. Never thought of that. You see, <laughs> I thought a guy named Fred Williams would have Williams <laughs> Creek right, named after him. Right. Bill so, Dietz, okay. So he goes back to, they eventually, it's the February of 1861, so they go back to Antler Creek, get their supplies together, and they, they come back in with rockers and so on, and he, he, he actually stakes a claim in there, and his, his claim really never amounts to much. Now, it's strange because Dutch Bill Dietz is the original discoverer. The creek's named after him. He dies uh, 14 years later, absolutely dead, broken, forgotten in Victoria but some of the others go on to great fame. And some of the guys who staked above the canyon, guys like Billy Cunningham, and he wrote back to Victoria, a guy named Joe Lovett, he wrote in Victoria, and he says, Joe, I'm doing well. Claim is paying off two to $3,000 a day. Now, when you put that in the context of today, Mike, that means he was making from $100,000 to $150,000 every day he ran those sluices, and they were running seven days a week. Hang on, and he wrote back to his friends in Victoria yeah. about this? Yeah. He told well, them. they must have told somebody <laughs> the, the, the place is going crazy. The word is the word always gets out. <laughs> and so the, the guys above the canyon are doing very well. The guys in the canyon aren't doing very well. And a new town comes into being. And this is called Richfield. And this is a shot of Richfield here in its early days in the 1860s. And Richfield is the big town at that time. But then a guy called Ned Stout, who's an old Indian fighter and had almost been killed in the, in the Fraser River War in 1858, he decides to go below the canyon. He's had a little experience in the Placer Fields. He goes down there and hits some fairly good gold, and the gold, Mike, is a different color. It's a bright gold. So he figures it's come from a different run, and maybe there's more gold down there, but he hasn't tapped tap bedrock, and that means you're really, you don't get on the lead until you tap bedrock. Get on the lead. That's, That's right. Find the... 
the gold deposits. That's, That's right. good on the lead. Okay. And he's talking around a saloon some night, and there's a, there's an old there's an old miner in there who's actually in his 30s, but he looks old, and his name is Billy Barker, and he's illiterate. He's an English seaman, and he's looking for a stake. There's no room on the upper canyon. There's no more room up way above above the creek, but there's lots of room down below. So he goes down there, and he's a strange guy because he had a recurring dream. And the number 52 keeps on coming up in this dream. 52, 52, it comes up in this Decker dream. Decker cards. That's somewhere. right, time, time again. And so anyway, he gets together about half a dozen other men, and they sink a shaft down there, and they go down 20 feet. Now, that's a lot of work, Mike, because you have to winch this up. It's tough work. Each bucket full of gravel to sink that shaft means it has to come out of there and be dumped. And there's big rocks in gra river gravels. Back-breaking work, back-breaking work. But he goes down past 20 feet, down to about 30 feet. They say, well, let's call it. There's nothing down here. Well, he says, come on, keep on going. They go down to 40. Now he has a real tough time convincing, convincing these guys to keep on on the track. They go down to 50, and they're ready to call it off. He says, just go a couple of feet more. They go down to 52, Mike, and they hit a king's ransom. There's the lead. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of ounces, like coarse gold like this, <laughs> and much coarser than this. He always brings gold. Oh, sure. Yeah. And some of, the, some of the gold was two and three ounce slugs. And, of course, the word flashes up the creek that Billy Barker's hit the lead below the canyon. Well, the result is everybody stampedes. And you've never seen a stampede like it because there were hundreds and hundreds of miners scrabbling to get that extra ground. And some of them are very lucky. And some of them are are astoundingly lucky. One is the guy called John A. Cameron, who comes from Glengarry, Ontario, brings his wife in. She doesn't like the gold fields, but he hits it on the Cameron claim. And he does hit it indeed, Mike. Spectacular run on the Cameron claim, along with Bobby Stevenson and about five other guys. And he actually makes a fortune and leaves the caribou, an extremely wealthy man indeed. John A. Cameron. John A. Cameron. Now, he goes by another. I think we all know him better as Caribou Cameron, don't yeah, we? Yeah, and I don't think it would have been called Caribou Cameron if his, if his name had begun with any other any other letter except C. Yeah. Where did the the whole concept of Caribou come from? Anyway, I don't mean to digress here. You can well, well, omit that, but you know, I found that in some research. I'm glad you mentioned it because I did find that in some research in one of the old newspapers in British Columbia. And a group of Canadians were on the Quesnel River, actually on the North Fork of the Quesnel, which was called the North Fork then. They looked across the river and they saw a bunch of caribou. Caribou? Uh, that's right. And they said, gosh, that must be caribou country. And that's where the word caribou got its, got its name. And the misspelling and everything is just because oh, old sure. miners were not they, too erudite. Yes, they were not very literate, many of them. Okay. And, you know, in some of these mines now, now what happens now below the canyon, 1862 and 1863, uh, they start sinking their shafts and they hit at various depths, some at 50 feet, some at 40 feet, some at 75 feet. And there's problems in this ground because the caribou slum comes in, which is a mixture of water and clay, very tough. They have to have Cornish wheels to pump out that water all the time. And a couple of these mines here, the Mucho Oro, which was, which was a small mine, really, only produced about $50,000. Gets a lot of publicity, though, obviously. Yeah, it does. the photographer, that's but, right. but they, it didn't amount to that's much. That's right. And the Never Sweat was a little different. Now, that's a, that's a classic shot of the Never Sweat. They produced, by their admission, $250,000, which is a little less than a ton. But I think, Mike, what really happens here is they probably produced a little more than a ton, possibly two tons. And a lot of these guys, because it was a gold tax, they hid the gold and didn't declare so that the, the figures you get today from those caribou gold fields are really underestimated by mm -hmm. far, maybe two or three times as much at least. Good heavens. Well, if the Mucho Oro and the Never Sweat, the ones that have gotten lots of publicity, yeah. were, were really small ones, what are the big ones? What are, what well, are we talking about the here? The big ones are spectacular. This would be the Aurora. And the Aurora was the biggest mine in the caribou as far as recorded production, $850,000. And at that time, that's between two and three tons of gold. Then you had other claims, such as the, the, the Ericsson and the, the Barker and the Cameron and the Steel, and, and it goes on and on. And a lot of these mines produced between two and three tons of gold admitted. These were recorded. So you say multiply that by two or three to get the actual amount because the guys avoided the tax. That's right. You know, Six tons of gold. Oh, yeah, sure. Tons sure, of tons, gold. Tons, yeah, not pounds, not hundreds of pounds, but tons. <laughs> And, uh, you know, some of these guys, well, well the, the, the amounts that they made per day were absolutely staggering. There's one mine that they said they only made $300,000 from. This is the Diller claim, named after J.P. Diller. And he said that he would not leave Caribou, Mike, until he left with the weight of his, uh, his own weight in gold. He got his own weight in gold. He weighed about 210 pounds. And then he said, well, I'll throw in my dog, too. His dog weighed about 30 <laughs> Seeing pounds. Seeing as i got a few more That's right. nuggets to go around so here. There's 240 pounds. He said, i better throw in a little more. 
and he left with his with his with his dog and his and his horse carrying over 250 pounds by himself and went eventually down into the states made another fortune on the founding of this fortune in the civil war down there and that is but that isn't the end of it now some of these other other areas were spectacular. For instance, the famous <laughs> this Erickson. Was, this wasn't spectacular. Oh, yeah. Well, his best day was 202 pounds. But the Erickson. Best day. Best day. One day, 202 pounds. And that's pretty well documented. But the Erickson yielded 200 ounces a day, day after day after day, week after week after week, month after month after month. What, how much ground are we talking about here? I mean, if this is a claim, how much ground average, is... Average was only about 100 feet. Some were 80, some were 125. Sometimes they added up two claims together. But what we're looking at, Mike, is we're looking at 100 claims that produced varying amounts of gold. 100 good claims. Now, some of those claims that were down below the meadows couldn't bottom. They couldn't hit the lead. They couldn't hit the bedrock. They had too much problem with the water and stuff, yeah. but but when you when you look at the at the first three dozen claims in the caribou on Williams Creek about 30 to 35 of those admitted they had mined somewhere between one and three tons don't believe it for a moment no because naturally they mined at least three to five tons or perhaps more and some <laughs> names you never hear of and of course what happens is uh, a town springs into being and this this town is called cameron town and here it is in 1860s in all its glory you know the paper you know side by side wooden wooden cabins taking a chance and they name this of course after caribou cameron, cameron which yeah. is the logical thing but then cameron town starts slipping about 1867 and another town takes its place and this is barkerville of course named after billy barker just a little further down. That That's picture. right. And uh, it's just uh, just up, actually. And so Barkerville comes into being, and it is really quite a spectacular town. Now, you've got a painting here. This is just a wonderful yeah. piece of work. Tell me about this piece of painting. Who painted it and when? Well, that painting is, is I uh, acknowledge to be the most famous Goldfields painting in, in, in Canada. It was painted in 1863, which was the top year of the gold rush, where they said only 10 tons came out, probably 20 or 30 came out of gold. And it was painted by a guy called Frederick Wimper, who was the most renowned Goldfields artist. And if you look at it very closely, you'll see it says Barker's Claim and Barkerville, and, it, and it's really quite spectacular. Barkerville, Williams Creek, Caribou. Where did you find this piece of work? I Actually, mean, this is I, just wonderful. I got it off a dealer years ago, paid some thousands of dollars for it, and he obtained it from a guy who came in from Australia. And it makes all sorts of sense, Mike, because the, there were a lot of Australian miners in the Caribou at that particular time. And to show you what they were trying to sell the public, take a look at this. This is, this is an original stock certificate? That is an original stock certificate. I took very good care of it. And it's one of the, actually one of the most expensive stock certificates in North America. And the reason it's expensive is because it's rare. And on the other side, as you can see, it is really quite spectacular. It, it is, shows there. It's glittering like That's gold itself. Right. You can see it's... Sure. It's the Great Caribou there. Gold Rush, and, uh, or the Great Caribou Gold Company. And this was put out by a guy called Unversack, who was one of the biggest thieves in the caribou. But the stock certificate is superb. There are bottles of gold on each side, nuggets above and below, underground scenes, the whole thing. And, of course, the result was he managed to milk the investors for about 40 years. So there was gold in them, our papers as well. I mean, if it wasn't, couldn't be made in the creeks, it could be made on a stock exchange selling just the legend of Barkerville. That's right, and he was, he was actually down in Wing Dam, in the Wing Dam area, which is just, just west of the Barkerville area, but gives you an idea of how they were fleecing the public, and of course they did fleece the public. <laughs> this piece of paper alone, though, just the very fact that it is as bright as it is, and the yep. gold glistens on yep. it, what a, what a treasure this well, is. Well, it sold for about $2,000, so it gives this, you an oh, idea. This is, this yeah. is the artifact is worth... Yeah. Yeah. I've got two of them, one with what we call the, uh, the bully and warrant on top of it, too, which no one has. They're just kind of pinned on there. That's what he uh, used as another draw, or a lure, shall we say. Going to take a break here, but when we come back, there's so much more of a story evolves and develops, and we'll do that right after these words. Don't go away. Around about 1863-64, Cameron Town fades, Barkerville comes on the scene. Yeah, Cameron Town really disappears by 1867, and Barkerville takes its place, and Barkerville is, is teeming with people. 
you know, there are still people who say that there's deeper ground, it's becoming more expensive, Mike. And you get a lot of characters in this town. You know, there's a famous saloon in the town called the Wake Up Jake. And they don't even know in Barkerville, it was named after an American miner whose name was Franklin. And he was <laughs> called Wake Up Jake Franklin because they had a tough time waking this guy up in the morning. So Wake Up Jake is named after a guy named Franklin because yep. he was hard to wake up. That's okay. right. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Jack of Clubs Lake and Jack of Clubs Creek, that was named after a guy called William Giles, who adopted the nickname Jack of Clubs. He was, he's in a high-stakes poker game, Mike, and he holds the Ten of Clubs and the Queen of Clubs and the King of Clubs and the Ace of Clubs. Now, that's, that's a royal flush if you can get the Jack. There are a whole bunch of cards left in the but deck. you never draw to an inside. That's right. He draws, gets the Jack of Clubs, cleans up, gives him a great stake, and he calls himself Jack of Clubs. And they name the lake after him, and, uh, sure. and I think that's, there's a Jack of Clubs hotel up in Wells that's this very right. day. Yeah. Named after him. And of course, there are a lot of other characters in town itself. Uh, there, there, there's a woman there who's probably the most fo famous owner of the hotel, and ho her hotel is the Hotel de Paris. And she actually owned a Hotel de Paris in Victoria as well, moves into the heart of the gold fields, brings in the German hurdy-gurdy go girls, has uh, the hurdy-gurdy -gir girls dancing in her hotel, and uh, that's all they were. They were only dancers, that's all. And she has high-stakes poker games, and these actually came out of her hotel, and they're very rare. There's some in Barkerville, and I've got the others. And that's a $1 chip, Mike, the, the plain one. one. And here. the other two, which are etched, hand etched, on ivory, there's a $25 chip and a $5 chip. These are on ivory. These are not that little, com that uh, sort of composite uh, No, no, material. not French ivory. No, no, no. This, this, is this is actually ivory and very, very rare indeed. I mean, I have hundreds of poker chips in my collection, but these are the three best. These are the three premier chips out of the collection. Those are and of course, you know, there were high stakes poker games, and it was very interesting poker games because what happened in this area, both on Lightning Creek and in Barkerville, they had a, a, a peculiar habit. And a, a deck of cards was about a dollar at that time, Mike. And if a guy was having a run of bad luck, he'd take that deck and throw it over his shoulder onto the floor. Say, dealer, bring me another deck. And sometimes there'd be 75 decks of cards on the floor after an all-night or two-nights game of playing poker, draw poker, which was probably the most common game. Well, would they package those decks up and use them again, or would it just go out in the garbage? Well, no, they'd just go out in the garbage. They wouldn't use them again. <laughs> oh, no. They couldn't, they couldn't uh, put those back into play. Once you some broke the next... seal, uh, uh, you, they, right. were, they were no good. Yeah, and of course, there were lots of other famous characters. One guy, a uh, uh, guy called Morris, who was a miner, not well known until after this event. And he's, he's coming up from Quinnell Mouth, which is now the city of Quinnell. And he is coming into Barkerville, and uh, he looks through the bush and he sees what he thinks is a grizzly bear with a big hump on its back and it's all kind of a mottled brown. And gosh, he grabs his rifle and brings this beast down and, and he goes over to look at it and there's a big hump on its back. And some other miners following him say, well, what'd you shoot, Morris? Oh, he says, I don't know, I thought it was a grizzly bear. Oh, he says, damn fool, that's camel. <laughs> he shot one of the uh, well, one of the the rare, the Laumeister's rare. camels of the, of the camel group that came in. Laumeister was going to carry, have the camels carry all sorts of goods into the it caravan. It never really worked. Yeah. And so, but Morris, you see, he gets the name Grizzly Morris, oh, all, and he carries it all the rest of his life, but he's kind of proud of it. So he, he stakes a mine, which are a claim which he calls the Grizzly Claim. Oh. And he doesn't do too badly. He takes out $50,000. Not bad. Just a, just yeah. a little steak. Well, sure. Oh, on the basis of him smoking this cow. Oh, sure day. it is. Sure it is. And, and, of course, the town itself, if you look at the scenes of the town, you'll see this is, a, this is a shot from the 1860s. And what is happening here, they're driving cattle through the town. And these cattle come right up from the States, most of them. So they're coming into, into, into Barkerville to feed the miners. They've been driven all the way up over that interior plateau, all the way into Barker, around the long route, tough, but they made a terrific profit. And, of course, Barkerville itself is really quite, quite an interesting town. Well, I hear the, about the eggs going for 25 bucks a piece or something. Is that apocryphal? Well, or that, is this... that was more in the Yukon, Mike, than it was in the, it was in the caribou. So the, the, the prices were not as high in the caribou as they were in the Yukon. There's no doubt about that. But, of course, this is, uh, this is quite, a, quite an intriguing area and a lot of fascinating characters. Uh, one, one, of the, one of the most interesting guys is an old guy called Sam Montgomery, and we'll see him in this shot here, and he's working on a creek. He's about 80 in this photograph here, and Sam Montgomery... Is, is a guy who never really made it. He made a little bit of money on the Montgomery claim down in Lightning Creek, and he mines till, till his dying day, like old Bill Brown, who was 100. He didn't stop mining till he was 100. And old Sam is dying in the hospital, and one of his friends, I think it was Bo Winner, who went and saw him, who was the gold commissioner, and, and Sam is saying, you know, he says, uh, and he's not very well, he, he, but he, he thinks he's going to get out in the creeks again. Yeah. 
and he says to Bo, and he says, uh, I want you to get me out of here. He says, uh, 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 this is just the indomitable sort of spirit of these guys. He says, I, I want to go up to Jawbone Creek. He says, John Ferriama, he said there was some good gold up there, and if John says so, it must be so, and I'd like to get out of here. Well, old Bowen goes back to get him the next day, and he's passed on to and cross the Great Divide, as they say in the, yeah. in the mining circles. So up to, literally, his dying day. From his deathbed, sure. he's still wanting to get back to the creeks. Oh, yeah. And how long does Barkerville actually last? If it sort of rises in the <sighs> mid-1860s, yeah. how long does it last? Well, let's say the height of Barkerville is probably when the Great Fire occurs. And the Great Fire occurs in, in September of uh, 1868. And what happens is there's a girl ironing in, in Barry and, and Adler's saloon in, in Barkerville, and somebody comes and bothers her. She drops the iron. The curtains catch on fire. And the whole town, virtually all the town, goes up in flames. And the losses were spectacular, probably about $700,000 in goods. Over 100 buildings go down. Now, you hear that Barkerville housed 10,000 people, Mike. That's incorrect. The maximum Barkerville would have housed was somewhere between three and 4,000. And I'm probably being lenient on that. So certainly this has been an exaggeration which has been perpetrated by various writers who really haven't done their research on this. Because they called Barkerville what? The biggest city north of San Francisco and sure. west of St. Louis. I, I, at that time, I can, I can name probably a dozen other towns, Portland, Oregon, a whole bunch of towns in Montana and uh, other towns in Washington State that were far bigger than Barkerville was at its height. It was more hype. It was, you know, sure. I mean, if you were going to Barkerville, this was sure. just a hype. But the fire, of course, was disastrous, and they were lucky, too, because they had 50 kegs of, of powder in the, in, the, in the path of the fire, and they managed to move those out of the path of the fire. Otherwise, the whole town probably would have been flattened with 50 kegs of powder. Well, it was flattened, but I guess not with an explosion that rendered life and limb. No, about two-thirds of the town was gone, Mike. All the, all the upper part of town and most of the central part of town, a little bit in the, in the western part of town, wasn't gone. And so they do rebuild Barkerville and Barkerville retains some of its old, its old fabric and its old interest, but not, not, like the, not like the first Barkerville, not like the Barkerville of the early 1860s. But what keeps miners there, Mike, is this, is that it's a very fascinating geological problem, and what is, what is the problem is, is that in the meadows below Barker, Bar Barkerville itself, and then in the western part of Williams Creek, are what, we, what they call the deep ground. And the deep ground really means that they haven't bottomed or they haven't touched bedrock. And that's where almost all your gold is always in, in the gold fields of, as far as placer gold is concerned. So you had a number of companies, the John Bull and the Richfield and the Levin of England, and all these companies, some of them expended fortunes trying to tap that deep ground. Now we do know this, that they were unable to do it because their pumps couldn't keep up with the caribou slum. So that when the pumps couldn't keep up with the caribou slum, that slum would come in, and sometimes the miners were killed. And in fact, if you looked at the old, at the old records of the cemetery in Barkerville, most of those miners there lived till their 30s. A lot of them killed in accidents. Even the doctor died. I think his name was Wilkinson. He died at 35. So that 31, 34, 36, 38, common age of death in that particular area. And the interesting thing is that ground is still there, Mike. There, that ground, the deep ground below Barkerville, has never been tapped, even by modern, modern methods. And, of course, we don't know how much gold is there. The, the quantities must be magnificent. Well, if they were hauling 200 pounds of gold out of these places a day... Well, that's, that's the rare occasion, but, yeah. you know, 200 ounces a day was quite commonplace in the early years. But you know it's there under the meadows, waiting sure. for technology. That's right. Excellent, Bill. Thanks very much. You're welcome. Barkerville and the characters, thanks for joining us. Bye-bye.